वाइस प्रेसिडेंट मिहिर भाई शेठ ऑनरेरी सेक्रेटरी चिराग दोषी स्पीकर फॉर द सेशन सी ए गंदरव टोंगिया इज इट ऑडिबल Is it audible? Okay. A very good evening to all, assembled virtually as well as physically. We as chartered accountants have been serving clients in ensuring accurate accounting and carrying out statutory and internal audits. The skill sets which are majorly required for such assignments are knowledge of business processes, accounting and auditing standards, corporate laws and tax laws. these skills skill, skill sets definitely equip us to know the operations of the business at macro level while carrying out audit assignment and inquisitive auditor with an intent to understand the nuances of the business would delve deep into the transactions processes contracts logistics marketing and other aspects of the operations then there may be comparisons with financials of competitors to benchmark the financials of the audity by carrying out such a in depth uh, in uh, functions an astute auditor would be in a position to add value to his own knowledge as well as provide qualitative inputs to the audity for improving the operations based on vast pool of clients with whom there are assignments for audit and other professional areas in recent times business complexities have increased tremendously due to accelerating shift towards online transactions digital payments and complex structuring it is a necessity for the professionals to be equipped with the knowledge of how the business are operating whether he is an auditor or representing the corporate entity in various roles up to the level of cfo or ceo to be successful on either side as a professional there are certain skill sets which have to be consciously developed over years in light of this thought process we thought it fit to invite today's speaker sri gandharva tongya to delve into the qualities which he developed over the years while making shift from being an able auditor to taking up assignments in industry and climbing up the ladder in industry to be the cfo at one of the prominent fast moving electrical goods company polycab limited he has several accolades to his credit which would be highlighted when he is officially introduced by to the participants today we are sure this lecture will enable the participants present to take home the learnings and will inspire them to take on more responsibilities as ca professionals thereby adding value to their clients and be looked upon as business advisors this in turn will provide them cutting edge knowledge to compete in the professional world i take this opportunity where more than i think 70 odd participants have joined or 100 odd participants have joined virtually and a limited number which are present physically over here to briefly provide glimpses of the activities that bcs undertakes for the benefit of those who may not be part of our bcs family in fact it is heartening to inform that today's speaker is also part of the bcs core group and contributes to the progress of the society bcs is the oldest voluntary body of chartered accountants and will be entering the 74th year by the end of fortnight from today bcs strives to disseminate knowledge to members build their skill sets and to provide a networking platform to like minded professionals it also acts as a catalyst by representing to the government bodies for bringing out better and effective government policies i earnestly request non member ca professionals to become bcs members so that you all enjoy the benefits of excelling as professionals this will be achieved through gaining of in depth knowledge from attending workshops seminars and residential courses which are organized throughout the year you will also have access to the bca journal a gateway to insights on topics of professional interest and considered as one of the best professional journals for chartered accountants this membership and involvement in the activities of bcs will also incline you to give back to the society through your sharing of knowledge i thank you all and have an insightful session i now request president elect mihir bhai shet to introduce ca gandharva tongya thank you
good evening to all of you uh, first let me apologize for having a little technical glitch but i can assure you that we are only getting better because we are in the process of making a shift from a physical mode to a hybrid mode and these are all the hiccups which are as would happen initial hiccups so it could only get better from there so my apologies to all the viewers and also to the speaker let me have this pleasant task of introducing today's speaker gandharva tongya is not a new name to bcs i'm quite sure many of you have heard he has been a frequent speaker on this platform and has given some very insightful talks and has participated in discussions over the last few years he is a fellow member of icai with over 20 years of experience he is also a company secretary and a bcom from the university of rajasthan he is a cfo of polycap limited and he is instrumental in getting polycap listed he has transformed the organization by preparing a strategy for future and also executed the same he has won several awards such as the best cf of india mid cap by the lal street investment journal and cfo excellence award by cii gandharva earlier worked for indian member firms of ebi and deloitte and provided assurance and consultancy services to varied nature of businesses in india and overseas He has also worked on a range of assignments with expertise in financial statement auditing, accounting, and reporting, financial due diligence, internal control, reporting, and accounting advisory matters. He has also significant experience of capital market transactions, including IPO, QIP, and bond offerings. Gandharva has participated in learning and development initiatives. He regularly participates as trainer and speaker in external forums. He has prepared and presented technical papers on various matters, and he has also assisted the ICAI in preparation of technical publications. He is associated with professional bodies and actively contributes to their activities, including representations to the regulators and government. he also represent the industry in various committees of such professional bodies now let me get to the softer side the other side of mr gandharva tongya which is non academic he is associated with an ngo and actively supports needy particularly those who are from the bottom of social pyramid he is truly following ck prallad's theory that the rise will happen from the bottom and he is helping his best with this let me hand over to uh, do we have a moment yeah let me request vijay bhai to give a moment to to gandharva <laughs> over to you thank you bye bye and meet bye for the kind words and introduction uh, respected uh, gcas office bearers and my friends 
it's a matter of indeed pride and privilege to be here and addressing all the all of you physically as well as virtually before i get into this topic let me take this opportunity to appreciate and acknowledge the great work which bcas team is doing year after year uh, you know every year i come here i feel like this is the best year of bcas and then i come next time around and i realize that bcas again raised the bar so when we are getting into the 75th year of bcas i'm sure under leadership of president elect uh, meer bhai we will further raise the bar and meer bhai you'll continue to get support from all of us including me so thanks a lot uh you know i had a chat with abhay by almost 9 months back and that is when he mentioned that i should be sharing my journey of uh, you know transitioning transitioning from auditor to cfo and unfortunately i made him chase me but uh, you know when i was thinking about this lecture this morning i realized that this is a wonderful gift which abhay bhai has given because in corporate life at times you not you not get uh, you do not get adequate opportunity to reflect and introspect and uh, abeba actually gave me this opportunity to introspect and reflect so thanks a lot abeba for this today's topic is not a technical topic you know it is like uh, sharing my journey talking about my autobiography i'm too young to talk about autobiography but what i will do is uh, i will give you my personal background so that you understand the choices which i made over the period what is the background and context mm -hmm. then i will talk about my journey of auditor and cfo and then i have preempted or uh, you know tabulated few likely q and a so i'll talk about those and in the end i'll probably get into the open forum i don't know how effectively we can do it in this hybrid mode but i'll try my own level best to cover your all your questions so as uh, uh, meher bhai mentioned i did my graduation from uh, university of rajasthan jaipur i was born and brought up in jaipur and uh, i did my article ship incidentally from a tax firm it's a very large firm it's still a, a very large in jaipur and when i was doing uh, my article ship i thought that i will become a taxational professional uh, in those days and i think to a certain extent even today also there are limited opportunities available for chartered accountants in states like rajasthan and jaipur and that was a period when the ici started with campus placement so few of our friends felt that we should go to bombay and appear for campus placement and that is why how first time in my life i came here coincidentally none of my friends joined us so it was like like typical goa plan which is very difficult to implement and that is what happened with me and first day of my campus placement in those days c institute used to be in corporate who are familiar with uh, with uh, bombay and first day itself during the lunch break couple of other participants suggested that there are good ca firms around why don't we just go and meet these ca firms and that is how i reached to a firm called af ferguson i was so naive in those days that i didn't know what is af ferguson you know so you can relate uh, and uh, i met my first mentor there he interviewed me couple of them interviewed me and one of them became my mentor later and i was hired and selected then and there and offered uh, uh offered uh, a position and then i thought there's a point going back to icia for campus let's join this firm and that is how i started my audit experience and for next 3 years i did audit of manufacturing companies uh, uh cement companies steel companies predominantly uh, manufacturing companies a bit of hospitality companies and traveled uh, across the world uh, or in those days actually across the country and learned a fair amount about corporate uh, style of working preparing accounts consolidation and whatever you can link with accounting and auditing in the third year of my association of ferguson i was serving a cement client and that client decided to change its auditor from a ferguson to sr bartley boy which is a member firm of ey and the way the auditing moved even the auditor also moved so i also moved to uh, ey and i was with ey for good 12 years and did uh, almost everything which you can associate it uh, with a large firm whether it's accounting auditing consultancy and slowly and gradually i was able to move up it's okay. so slowly and gradually i was able to move up in the corporate ladder i started like a typical audit preparer uh, 
you know, the members who are from the profession, they would be able to relate. Am I audible there? Okay, okay. And then slowly and gradually, uh, I uh, became a reviewer. And eventually, in my final years of EY, I was responsible for more of business management or firm related activities, training or HR and so on and so forth. Uh, after completing 12 years EY, there was a time when I felt that I should explore opportunities outside the profession. And that is when I decided to join this organization, uh, which is my current employer, Polycab India Limited. As Abhav I mentioned, uh, Polycab India Limited is the largest cable and wire manufacturer uh, in the country. And, uh, um, you know, in the first year of uh, uh, my uh, association with Polycab, the expectation was to get the company listed. And I was lucky any, enough to deliver that baby uh, exactly in the ninth month. So I joined the organization in the month of July of 18 and uh, in the month of March of 19, the company got listed. And then after that, of course, I uh, contributed to the success of the organization. Where, uh, since the time I have joined the organization, Since the time I've joined the organization, the organization revenue has doubled, the uh, profitability has tripled, and the market cap after the listing is 4x even after today's meltdown. And uh, of course, there are other parameters which are completely better. So that's a broad journey. Uh, after hearing what whatever I shared, the natural question would be that uh, what is the expectation from the CFO vis-a-vis -vis the auditor? And with the help of this slide, I'll probably attempt to share my uh, thoughts. In today's world, CFO is not no longer a bookkeeper or accountant. Uh, you know, in gold olden days, the expectation was the, the CFO would be only a bean counter, uh, you know, who will just compute the numbers, report the numbers. I don't think that is the role which is expected from current uh, era CFO. There are different shades and activities. So for example, one would expect a CFO to be an accountant, to be a compliance manager, to a fund manager or a treasury manager, or someone who's going to manage the IR activities. But if I were to give you a framework, I think the framework is he is the chief value officer. And the way to read this or understand this is we should define the value. And then after that, we should protect the value, liberate the value, generate the value, and eventually communicate the value. Let's spend a few minutes understanding what do you mean by protect value. And what I will do is I will also give you some examples of uh, what I did at Polycap so that I can bring some, some uh, you know, real-time uh, case studies when we talk about this. So protect value is is the basics of the CFO function, which would mean the basic controllership, basic accounting, basic bookkeeping and reporting. That is protect value. But how you can take it to the next level is the example which I'm going to explain to you now. Polycap before I joined and uh, it used to take almost 12 months to report its 12 months numbers, you know, and frequently after taking MCA or ROC's approval for uh, extended period for AGM. Uh, now Polycap is probably one of the first in the industry of cable and wire to report the numbers. We report the numbers with, within 15 to 20 days. So that is a transition which Polycab has seen. And that is one example of protect value. The other example of protect value is, can you move away from the sheer compliance to delight of the stakeholder? To give you an example, under SEBI LODR, as you know, there is a requirement to publish quarterly results under regulation 33, which is one page or two page of press release. That is an option which is available, but that would be a compliance. Whereas what Polycap chose and our team chose is we are going to publish condensed financial statement, which is India's 34 or old gap AS25. Now, as of today, there is no company in mid cap which is doing it, but the choice is whether you want to do only a basic compliance or you want to add to the delight of the stakeholder or shareholder. And if you choose to do this, then that is where you are protecting value. The end result is last year, ICI gave uh, Excellence in Financial Reporting Award to Polycap, uh, a company which got qualified by its auditors a few years back. And I was a person who was involved in the audit in those days of this entity. And 
as well as got a disclaimer on ICFR, has moved from that side of the table to this side of the table. So that is the example of protect value. So as a as a chartered accountant and as a CFO, when you are in working in industry, you are expected you are expected to protect the value. Uh, but in today's world, that is, that alone is not enough. Now the expectation is ESG or integrated reporting. So so you should not associate yourself only with the financial numbers. You should also have a complete visibility of non-financial number. What is the impact your entity or your organization has on the external world and the society and whether it's positive or not, and then explain that by way of the integrated reporting to the stakeholder. So that's on protect value. Liberate value is how do you simplify the processes? If you can simplify the processes, you potential of the company. To give you an example, you know, since we were struggling to prepare accounts in good olden days, any which ways we didn't have MIS in process, uh, uh, MIS process in place. Today, almost everything is available on BA2. We have dashboards available. I get first message in the morning on WhatsApp on the revenue, which was achieved on the previous day. Uh, almost everything can be accessed with the help of a mobile or a laptop or iPad and you can touch and it's a real time information. So that is a transition which is expected when you want to support as a chartered accountant or as a CFO on the liberation. And this was acknowledged by CII when they gave us the award, which is what uh, uh, Mirbai mentioned a while back. The third and the probably one of the most important one is generate value. You know, the first two are, are basic activities of the CFO, but CFOs are not there just to do compliances or reporting or processes. They have to partner with the business. A uh, business partnership is where, you know, CFOs uh, who have a particular way of managing or looking at the business and the business owners like CXOs or CEOs or the BU head, they can partner and bring growth to the table. And that is what we did at Polycap. We partnered with BCG and uh, embarked on a project by the name of Project Leap. Objective was to get to the better top line, better bottom line, better enablers. And this uh, has unlocked the value. The market cap, which has increased from 8,000 crore to almost 32,000 crore today, is a result of the activities which we had done under this pillar of generate value. The last one and the most important one, according to me, is communicate value. Whatever good work you do, you have to communicate to your internal as well as external stakeholders, including shareholders. You have to communicate in a way the way the layman would expect you to communicate. Uh, you know, all numbers uh, take you to a story, but you should be able to weave that story and communicate. That's the most important thing. And at times, I believe the chartered accountants have this development need of, you know, bringing numbers to a story, weave the story and communicate. But I think if you don't do it, you will not necessarily be adequately rewarded by the street or by the stakeholders. So there's a summary of broad expectation from the CFO as far as a large listed entity is concerned. But I would tend to believe this is broadly true for almost all type of entities. Whether you are a small entity or a medium entity or large listed, this uh, framework is by and large true. But if I move to the right hand side of my slide, that is where I attempted to compare auditor's role. And in the case of auditor, I would believe that his role would be to certify whatever CFO is doing, certify that value by following the gas as well as gap and give comfort to the user of the financial statement or user of the annual report. So that's the broad play between CFO and auditor. And this is the transition, which probably I covered a bit, but I will continue to do that as I move ahead in my CFO journey. What I will do in, in next five to 10 minutes is uh, talk about each of these uh, thoughts or questions. The first one to start with is, and I'm expecting the, the audience members and both physical as well virtual would have questions on similar lines. The first one is how do you become a successful CFO? Uh, now there is no perfect recipe for that. Uh, it could differ from person to person. But uh, if I were to give you a softer side of it, I think there are five C's which are important. 
to ensure that you become a successful CFO. The first one is you should be curious. You should always try to learn more about your business, your processes, uh, you know, the new development uh, which are, are there on the horizon, whether it's digital or technology, your peers, and so on and so forth. You know, when you are reviewing the numbers of a particular company's financial statement as an auditor, your objective is to ensure gap and guess compliance. Whereas as a CFO, you have to go to the next level, see whether a particular BU is profitable or not, whether a particular SQ is profitable or not, whether there is any scope for improvement on SCM side or not. And those questions are then required to be resolved with the help of your expertise so that business can continue to grow further. So that's on the curious. Second is CFO should be courageous. You should be able to ask difficult questions both internally as well as externally. Uh, the CFOs in today's world are not expected to, to be yes men, particularly when we have risk of non-compliances. So you should have courage to ask difficult questions and challenge the settled principles and see whether you are able to give adequate comfort both to internal as well as external stakeholders so that you are not doing something which is not accepted from you. Uh, the link thought here is, uh, you know, at times when you're working a promoted an organization or a small organization, you feel like that immediate supervisor is my promoter or my uh, chairman or my board, but that's not necessarily entirely true. You are the CFO of all the shareholders, whether the minority shareholder or majority shareholder. And that is where you have to ensure that whatever you're doing is good both for minority shareholders and majority shareholders, and at times more from minority shareholders perspective. So you should be courageous. Third is of course, confident. Uh, you should have self-assurance and you should be confident because if you are confident, then only you can venture into this journey and achieve what you want to achieve. Last is compliance, uh, where uh, you should know what is expected from you from the law point of view. Law is changing every day. Uh, at Polycab, I think we are tracking around 11,300 compliances. Um, and every second that there is some amendment or some notification, and you know this already, there is no single source of this amendment. You know, you can probably manage GST, but probably you'll miss on indirect or, or direct tax. You'll probably manage direct tax, indirect tax, you'll miss on SEBI. So changes are there. So you should be on top of it on compliances. And the last one is competence. If you should be having domain expertise. So if you're not competent, you can't do it. So just to wrap up my thoughts on CFOs, uh, there are five C's which are important. You should be curious. You should be courageous. You should be confident. You should know what is the compliance. And eventually you should have domain expertise and competence. Now, this is good to know, right? The next thought would be, how do you do this? Uh, again, no easy answer there, but I'll probably share my thoughts. Uh, one is I think I should know where I have, uh, you know, better skills than what is expected from me, but at the same time, where are my development needs? And once I've identified my development needs, uh, we should be able to go out of our comfort zone and develop on those. Uh, it could mean that, uh, you want to experience how the other functions are working. It could mean that experience other geographies, how the business are conducted outside India, outside of Asia. Or it could mean going for additional training. But uh, I think that's a prerequisite. Identify where you need to develop and then take current action. At times I've seen youngsters, they find it difficult to make investment in themselves. And that is where I believe if you can identify and make investment, that would go a long way to support in your journey towards the CFO position. Second is develop a strategic mindset. As an auditor, my thought process is on risk management, you know, identify the risk, mitigate the risk or report if I'm not comfortable, whether internally to the board or audit committee or externally as part of audit report. But when you move from auditor to CFO, you have to have a strategic mindset. You have to think beyond numbers and reporting. You have to see what I've achieved in the last year, what I missed and what I have to do differently in the years to come, what my competitors are doing. Uh, what other industry players are doing, which can be replicated in my industry and so on and so forth. Third is communicate effectively. Communication is the key, particularly when you are working like a CFO, you are like a co-pilot, you are number two in the company. And if you can't communicate effectively, uh, it would probably uh, result into some sort of difficulties in execution of your strategy. 
And this also brings in another angle to it is to have killer killing interpersonal skills. Uh, how do you persuade? How do you ensure that the change which you want to bring in or the change which you want to make, everyone in the organization is on the right side of that change. So it takes you to the interpersonal skills. And uh, the last one is uh, compliance and ethics. I don't think we can negotiate or compromise on compliance and ethics. So that is uh, the thing. Uh, the, the another thing is, uh, if you are already a CFO of a, of a small organization and you want to become CFO of a larger organization, or you are already on the path to become a CFO, I think there are two or three things you should probably do to, uh, to excel on that journey. One is uh, don't try to do everything uh, at your individual level. Hire good talent. Uh, you know, you are as good as your team or as bad as your team. So don't try to manage everything. You know, if you visualize CFO and if you relate with the previous slide, you are expected to know accounting, taxation, investor relation, uh, compliances, board, and so on and so forth. You, as an individual, you won't be able to manage everything. So continue hiring, invest in good talent. And by investing in good talent means uh, they should be able to manage almost everything independently. You would not be able to cover each of your team members every morning, right? So what you have to ensure is uh, give them right coaching, give them right ecosystem, and then ask them to perform. Of course, you have to give them safety net, but eventually they have to start taking ownership and they have to deliver. <clears throat> the second thing is if you want to become CFO and you are already on that path in the organization is remain approachable. At times when you are attempting to become CXO, uh, at times you are not approachable, right? You are always in one or the other meeting, board meeting, steer co meeting, strategy meeting, and so on. So don't do that. Anyone and everyone should be able to approach you. Uh, I think open door policy in few of the companies or the open culture with their following, which would help you. Uh, because if you are approachable, that is when your contribution will get noticed. If you are not approachable, even if you are best and you have the best domain expertise, your contribution won't be visible. And the last thing is, uh, be aware that you are being watched. You are number two in the organization. You are always on the stage. The way you conduct yourself is being watched. Uh, and don't assume that uh, whether in personal capacity or professional capacity, I can take a shortcut. To give you an example, one of my friend jumped a signal, not in Bombay, elsewhere. And uh, he was having a typical Indian conversation with the policeman. Uh, his CEO noticed it. And he made a comment the other day that you were doing something like this. Now think of this uh, from the context of the CFO, a CFO trying to do something which is, or a CFO aspirant trying to do something which is otherwise ethically not acceptable. So you are being watched. Uh, whether someone is actually watching you is not important. The fact is someone can watch you or probably you are being watched itself is good enough. So don't assume that there is no one in the room and you can do whatever you want to do. So that's on the, this, I think, Probably it would be a good idea to invite comments from the few team members who are here. If you want to ask anything on the first item, happy to explain before I get, get into the second. Please. How important is to have a support from the board? Because without the team support, to do so many things may not be possible in typical uh, promote driven uh, environment. Absolutely. So, you know, at times when, they, when we think about auditors, this assessment, and I am on this side of the table now, uh, I also think parallelly as CFO's risk assessment. I think the first step is when you are thinking about joining a company as a CFO or CFO aspirant, be absolutely comfortable that management is absolutely clean and willing to support you. If you believe that that's not the, you are not getting the right vibe, please don't proceed. Once you do that, and once you join the organization, please ensure that in first 100 days, you make your own impact. If you miss the first 100 days, it will be very difficult for you to get to that level of credibility. I'll share my own story. Uh, you know, as I mentioned a while back. Yeah, sure. Next okay. 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 So uh, what Chetan Bhai was trying to understand is, uh, if even if you want to do great things, if you don't get management support, how do you uh, ensure you get the management support? And as I alluded, 
Uh, first step is to ensure that you are joining the right organization, right set of promoters and the management team. And uh, second is ensure that you have your 100 days plan in place and you have your own impact. To give you an example, and it's not exactly 100 days, more than that, but uh, you know, when I was uh, hired by the existing company, uh, the first mandate was to get the company listed. And it was in the month of July. And uh, you would have noticed by now, I have talked about accounting challenges which we're facing, right? 12 months accounts getting prepared in 12 months. Uh, and there are several other internal challenges. But on top of it, all of a sudden in the month of December, we had several issues from the external world. Uh, I'm talking about December of 18, when we had issues between India and Pakistan. We had US and China issue. If you recollect, Trump used to have issues with China. And uh, there was a softness in the capital market. Uh, in that situation, everyone was of the view, including few of our investment investment bankers, that ye IPO to nahi hoga. Right. But in those situations, and I'm going back to my initial thoughts of five Cs, you have to be courageous. There's a lot of ambiguity, but you have to have your own impact. Persuade the team that will do it. Even if we fail, we'll attempt. And uh, that is how you can ensure that your domain expertise is recognized by the company or the management. And then for your next initiative or next set of initiative, you get adequate support. And there will be a time when you'll get to autopilot. Management would not ask you anything. Yeah, they will expect you to do what is expected from you. So that's there. Anyone else who would like to know anything on the first item before I get to the second one? Yes. Uh, yes. What is the CEO? I think it's a wonderful one. And I, even today, I think about this. Uh, I will not give you a technical answer. I'll give you a practical answer. Uh, and, uh, and my senior uh, colleagues here, and they would be able to relate. In corporate world, the top is very lonely. The CXOs, uh, because, you know, when they go and discuss with anyone, Generally, the expectation is either the CXO is, is trying to pass on a message or that individual is trying to pass on a message to the thing. So tone is very, uh, top is very lonely. So you as a CFO, you have to have that level of comfort that you can share anything and everything with me. Whether I can give you a solution or not, that's not necessarily important. I can hear you. I can act like a sounding board. According to me, this is one of the most important things. And when you get to that le level of repo, Probably you can get into decision making at, at a totally different level, uh, rather than just becoming an executioner or documenter or preparing a board agenda document. So that's one. Second is accept the reality that you are number two in the organization in a way, and you are a co-pilot. So when, and visualize an aircraft, right? So the pilot is doing almost everything, but you have your own role to play which indirectly means they have to support the pilot as well. So continue on that. So there could be several things, but if you were to ask me my top two thoughts, my top two thoughts would be that act like a sounding board to the uh, CEO. And second is assist him in whatever he wants to achieve as part of business uh, uh, by acting and behaving and working like a co-pilot. You had two questions. This is first. Second one, uh, what is what kind of challenges did you face to become a successful CFO and how did you overcome them? Yeah, very interesting one. That is why I mentioned when I was thinking about this lecture, it was like uh, introspection. So thank you, Abhay, again for giving me this opportunity. See, as an auditor, I excelled on several things. I learned several things, right? So those are positives. But at the same time, when I Shifted from this side of the table to this side, of, I had no option but to unlearn a few of those things. So I'll probably talk about what I learned and utilized, uh, or utilizing even today as a, an auditor and what I learned. So I think one is technical expertise that's given. You know, if you don't have domain expertise, you cannot be successful. And as an auditor and later as, uh, as responsible for relationship, I had a wider view when I was serving my clients and uh, that technical expertise, both on accounting side of it or consulting side of it helped. Second is, I think the ability as an auditor to have both micro and macro view, you know, uh, as an auditor, you can go to the last line item in the revenue GL and ask question and take a macro view and see whether this company's performance is making sense with the peers. I have, I as an auditor, I have that ability. So that helped. Uh, 
third is i think as an auditor all of us are very logical and structured in our thought process right so so that also helped and the last thing is i think time management and networking uh, you know i used to remember in ferguson we used to fill time sheet and those days used to be hand written time sheet since those days i am very cognizant of the fact that my time is very precious you know that's the learning which i have so there are several positives but uh, but if i come to the things which and i'll probably give you a couple of examples you know as an auditor i was trained to use checklist or use caro for example and give answers right yeah. but as cfo when i'm dealing with media for example i need not to go by that format so if checklist or a checklist wants me to check 30 samples i will always say i have done 30 samples but if media is going to ask me something i need not to answer that or probably again answer something but then take it to the story which i want to communicate because i will get only 120 and 180 uh, seconds time on the tv so you know and now my mindset as an auditor is that i have to follow the checklist there is a gentleman who has 25 years of journalism experience he is asking me something i have to answer but my cfo head will tell me okay attend this question in the most most acceptable manner but then please talk about what you want to communicate so that's one example the another example is business and process understanding you as a chartered accountant or as an auditor you do the process understanding from the risk perspective or from the icfr perspective but when you are on this side of a table you don't do it you do it from the business perspective so it's quite possible we jump to a conclusion that this number is immaterial or this line item is immaterial i'll not do it but actually is hard cash as a business so even if it is few dollars you would like to save it and fix it so business and process understanding the the depth is altogether different the third is business partnership uh, you know if i talk about large firms there is nothing called partnership there in terms of multiple individuals working on a particular project right it is a partner who is serving set of clients and all this so is is that partner and his team generally and of course larger partnership for the firm related but in the business is exactly opposite you have to partner with the ceo with the ceo with the cmd with the uh, other function heads and bu heads and that re- that requires again different mindset because as an auditor it quite it's quite possible you reach to a conclusion and my view is i want to qualify whether the audit committee board wants to accept or not but that is my view you know your that, that is your mindset or probably i would expect my audit also to fall in line i expect him to take that provision please take it if you don't take it i'll take it to audit committee that could be mindset you know not always but that could be my mindset but in the case of cfo you can't have that mindset it's not my way or highway i have to find ways and means to become a partner in the business development uh, yeah i think that's about it i can probably go on but broadly these are the things yes jovin bhai yes so you probably have told that okay book so zubin bhai i am being in my yeah so zubin bhai um, uh, i know it's a public forum and we are talking about a listed entity but then also uh, to the best of my recollection i don't think i had any instance of disagreement with the auditors um and my impression is auditors get lot of comfort when they see a chartered accountant who has worked with an audit firm serving like a cfo uh, or serving as a cfo because they know that when he was the auditor he had the same expectation so he will not put his friends and not necessarily friends his auditors in a spot which is otherwise not acceptable so i well, touch wood so far i have not experienced something of that nature but uh, but i'll tell you my thoughts given by there uh, i don't think the question is whether auditors would be convinced or not as a cf for the first step is whether i am convinced or not because uh, you know auditors generally speaking generally they come into picture when the agreement or the transaction has already been consummated or executed they come to a stage when I, the audit is getting into reporting or accounting or bookkeeping whereas the cfo is involved from day one right from strategy identification going through the options execution considering the implication both from the tax accounting reporting governance and so on and so forth so those are choices so give, to take you back to my previous example on rec 33 if i were to go back to my auditors and ask them that you know quarterly basis for the company list to year what should i do my impression is my auditor would expect me to do only rec 33 reporting which is only a press release but 
I as a CFO and my team uh, uh, was of the view that we should not go by the bare, mere compliance. You take, raise the bar and do something which is otherwise acceptable from a large company and we chose that. So I hope I have answered your question. Independent director who has been an auditor also sometimes face maybe many times that may not always be positively looked at by the other board members. Yeah, I mean, a person who has somebody like me who has predominantly had audit experience and also as an independent director who tries to see maybe things from the perspective of an independent director. So, similarly, I wanted to note whether you as a CFO also. Similarly, also try to visualize yourself in the shoes of an auditor also to say that, I mean, I should do things in such a way that there should be no queries and no disputes with the auditors. So, so that is, I think, acts as an advantage if I may act that way. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, you know, role of the independent directors in large listed companies and unlisted companies if they are on the board is also very important because... Uh, you as a CFO, you can go back to your independent directors, seek for guidance and advice. And invariably, independent directors uh, sits, uh, sit on several boards. So they have wider perspective available. Uh, at times, they can be pragmatic in their approach, but they can certainly add to your thought process. So that's a great, great, advantage, great example there. So quickly coming back to, uh, if there are any additional questions, I can take a pause. Otherwise, I can come back to this. Yeah. So quickly come back, coming back to the slide, I think I've covered the first two parts uh, already. I think uh, on the successful auditor, I would probably say that technical expertise is the most important. Uh, if you don't have gap and guess expertise, uh, if I, I became chartered accountants 20 years back and I believe that I will continue with my Indian gap and I don't want to invest time in India, I don't think that's acceptable. Or I became chartered accountant five years back and I believe that I don't want to learn about digital data technology or digital tools, I don't think that's acceptable. So expertise is given. Second is risk mitigation, uh, which is important. And third thing I think is important both for CFOs as well as auditors is networking. I think the events like these are important. Uh, if you have, if you don't have good network, you will find it difficult to uh, become a good, uh, successful auditor. Uh, key learnings as auditor probably have covered. The second last one, CFO order, which is better for me. I think this is very individual uh, choice. Uh, what if I were to give you my point of view, I think what we should do is assess, uh, you know, your own balance sheet, whether your skill set is better suited for audit or for industry and uh, whether I have the right inclination. So auditors, you can visualize there is a particular way of working. If you can relate as a young chartered accountant with that working style, where well, that risk and reward, of course, you should go there. But if you believe that this side of the table where I have industry expertise and all that, if you are able to relate with that, go for that. I don't think there is one answer which uh, can be used as a template for everyone. But I think the starting point would be to assess your own skill set and your inclination. And what should I do if I am an auditor and want to become a CFO? I think uh, by and large, I've covered it. I think five Cs uh, and my own assessment. I think last thing which I would like to add here is to have a very good mentor. Uh, I, as a young chartered accountant, and I'm assuming that most of our friends who have joined virtually are young chartered accountants with five, six, seven years of experience. If you are from that community uh, or age bracket or experience bracket, my request would be have a mentor and not necessarily you have to have only one mentor, you can have multiple, but always try to learn from um, someone who has fair amount of depth and experience. So that's on the Q&A, which I wanted to cover. I'll probably now open the forum for additional Q&A, both physically as well as virtually whoever joined. I think uh, one, one question which everybody wants to know from you is how did you reduce the time of preparation of accounts from 12 months to 15 days? Do you have some magical wand or something with you? Or, or what was the strategy behind it? I think there are only two things which are required. One is process re-engineering and use of technology. Uh, you know, I realized that we were doing in few of the processes exactly what ERP was doing. Uh, but we were uh, continuing with good older practices. You know, 
Bill Gates uh, best gift to the mankind excel is what we were using which was otherwise not required second is uh, i was fortunate enough and both as auditor as well as cfo is to have a great crack team uh, so the team and few of us used to slog 20 hours a day and i am not saying that's a benchmark you should not do that but the fact is few of us were willing to spend additional time late in the evening late in the night to streamline the process and which has held us. So I think two things, go back, revisit your processes, bring tech into the picture, bring digital into picture. And second is have the best uh, team in place. I think I firmly believe you are as good as your team and you're as bad as your team. So, uh, I mean, it could sound like that, whatever uh, I have talked about is what I have achieved individually, but very frankly, uh, I am only a part of the team. Whatever has been achieved in last few years, both as auditor as well as CFO, is just because of the great team, uh, which I was blessed to have. Uh, another question, uh, do you still use checklist? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, the larger CFO function uh, has no option but to use checklist. I mentioned a while back, there are thousands of compliances which we need to comply with. And all of these things, even, you know, uh, eventually we had to take it to the board and board has to be comfortable. And same is true with the auditors because as part of their ICFR reporting, they expect us to have the checklist. So that's there. But, uh, you know, since I'm fortunate enough to have a great team, I don't personally use the checklist, but uh, I have a, I have a, you know, slightly funny habit. I, I keep uh, a notepad with me and I keep notes and I continue to take notes and I'm an early riser. So I start my day pretty early. So first two, three hours are like those types of hours when my team members start getting emails from me or notes from me, or probably I jot down the notes and then give them first thing that I, so that is how I track it. I don't personally use a checklist, but of course the larger team, they have, they do that. And a few of our team members have reached to the stage where they come to my sign off only when they have completed a checklist, but not everyone Yes, Again, a journey or a few of us are still learning. Another question, when you actually decided to move from an auditor, you said you were doing a wonderful job, you were in place to one of the largest CA firms. What came to your mind to go to an entity which, which, which was earlier promoted, driven, less structured, uh, you know, won't have much controls because it is driven that way earlier. So what, what made you move that movement? Again, a great one. And this is what I was thinking away by that if I, if I'm asked what I'm going to talk about, but then I thought I should talk about what I felt when I took that decision. So one is uh, at that particular point in time, I felt that uh, I don't have enough opportunities left in that organization. And I love that organization. That's my old DNA uh, to learn and grow. Um, I felt that there is a particular path which is available. You know, think of it uh, and mo most of you work in large audit firms, so you would be able to relate, you know, think of it like this, that you are one of the partner there, right? Uh, when I was thinking about this role, uh, practically you are the one of the key decision maker. Uh, so that is one thing. The second thing is I genuinely felt that this company can do wonders. I, I knew the promoter since last 10 years um, and uh, the, the quantum of work the way they have done both in India, overseas, whether on the manufacturing side or social side, this company could be GE of uh, tomorrow. I mean, if we continue to do that. So I was genuinely, genuinely very convinced about the promoters, uh, integrity, their thought process, what they've done. And this company is 50 years old. The legal entity is 25 years old. The business is 50 years old. You know, so when Chetan Bhai was talking about, you know, how do you ensure that you do what is expected from you is the first thing is you ensure that the promoters are the best or the management team is the best. And I had that great comfort and repo that uh, I'm going to join the organization which has the best of the promoter and the management team. And that was the second reason why I chose to do this. Yeah, one question is that uh, in this challenging time of COVID, how did you maneuver uh, the company? I think first phase now, uh, though on paper we have everything, uh, business continuity plan and all that. First phase, we faced a lot of difficulty. Uh, all of a sudden, we realized that our channel partners were of the view that they want to retain the cash. I mean, cash in the sense, the payments which were due to us, and rightly so, uh, because the way we were thinking of conserving cash, they were also thinking of conserving cash. Then we have had several SCM or supply chain related issues. And so, slowly, gradually, we realized that it's not only SCM, it's people issues. 
There's someone who is getting hospitalized. There's someone who needs oxygen. There's someone whose relative is finding it difficult to get hospital. So every second day or every probably uh, after every few hours, our priorities were different. And then we realized that we have to have a crack team. And all of us, uh, and there are four or five of us in the organization who play these types of roles. All of us then started working on several work streams. One work stream was to ensure that we can optimize the cash flows, uh, both on the incoming cash flows as well as outgoing cash flows. Second is form a team to help the employees and so on and so forth. But after the wave one experience, when we got to wave two and wave three, we were better prepared. We didn't face any of those issues which we faced in wave one. Uh, the another good opportunity or good or only good thing which we got out of COVID was uh, penetration of tech. Uh, we started utilizing technology like anything. And, and of course, this hybrid today is given, but uh, you know, uh, you can relate the company which was struggling to publish the financial statement. The, the penetration of technology was not up to the mark, right? So all of us are done. What CFO couldn't do it, CIO couldn't do it, CEO couldn't do it, COVID did, and we started using technology. So, of course, we got better opportunities after COVID, but I think first wave was really, really difficult. I think some of the young guys, such as your experience online, wants to know that what, after your experience, what do you think, what are the skill sets which, as an auditor, you should further develop to become a good CFO? I think I'll probably take you back to uh, my five C's, uh, which I mentioned a while back. Uh, and I'm sure you would have taken a note of it. It is, uh, you should be curious. Uh, you should have fair amount of courage. You should be self-aware and confident. Uh, you should know what is compliance and non-compliance. And you should have, of course, domain expertise and competence. But having said that, I think you as a person, you should have your own balance sheet drawn up. You should know what are my positives and what are my development needs. Identify a mentor, invest in yourself and, and work on that. Then come to let's come to the next stage. If you are an auditor and you want to get to uh, a company or you want to become a CFO, I think there are three approaches or three routes available to get into the company. One is you, which is called staircase approach. You join the organization at the entry level and slowly and gradually you go up in the ladder. My, my expectation or my impression is that current generation not necessarily would like to take that route. But the second one is elevator, but it is not so easy. Uh, for elevator, you have to come out of your comfort zone, go for different experiences, move away from this organization to another organization, move from this function expertise to another function expertise, move from this geography to another geography. And third one, if you are really blessed is helicopter approach. You are already a, you know, a, a great auditor and you believe that uh, you can directly get to a CFO position, which has happened in few of the cases already. And I've seen both ways, you know, CFO or deputy CFO becoming auditor or auditor becoming CFO. And I know a couple of cases personally as well that happened. But I think these are three routes available. If you are five, six, seven year uh, old as far as CA profession is concerned, I my suggestion would be do your own balance sheet and see if you can take the route two, which is elevator approach. Jeeva Jawai. So excellent. Uh, you know, from the very, very you know, hypothetical question I want to ask. In hindsight, would you have said that, you know, since you are a successful CFO, how much credit of this would you give it to being a successful audit? So it's a hypothetical question. Yeah. I'm just... No, no, absolutely. That is a great one. I believe uh, the core expertise which I developed is because I was an auditor, you know, so the technical expertise or uh, the logical approach or trying to understand micro and macro picture or time management or networking. I think the core, whatever I've developed over the period is because I worked on several audits in several types uh, of companies in se several sectors of different sizes. So, and I had uh, opportunity to work with the, Two of the large, four large big four firms. So these MNCs also have their own style of working and that adds to a thought process. But having said that, I think that was not good enough. The expectation from the CFO is, is beyond accountant or 
or a reporting person. So as I mentioned a while back, you have to have a business partnership. This requires a totally different mindset. You know, uh, uh, and I alluded to a while back, you know, if I were to con continue with my approach of auditor, I would probably answer something what media wants to hear, right? Whereas I as investor relation or a spoke of the company, I have to probably talk about what I want to highlight. So that is where I have to rejig my mindset. It doesn't happen overnight, you know, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that your ask or ask from you as CFO is different from auditor. As long as you are able to uh, differentiate the two and you are able to appreciate the two, I think it's good. But to answer your question, I think core is because I was uh, fortunate to work by the large firms. Thank you. That's so good. Sure. No, but uh, for an auditor to CFO, now, what would you think from CFO to CEO? What would be the first? So, uh, Mirbai, first of all, I think uh, I believe not all the CFOs should attempt to become CEOs. Uh, you know, there's no end to it. Uh, I don't think you should get into that mindset that I, if I am a CX, so whether I'm a CHRO or CIO or whatever, CBO, I should become uh, this thing. So, one is the second thing is. Again, what is true for seven year experience chartered accountant is also true for that CFO. CFO should know what is his skill set. Can he manage the business the way CEO is expected to manage? Because if you, if you take a step back, CEO is the person who is actually taking business decision. CFO is partnering with him, assisting him, helping him. But the decision is being done, taken by the CEO. Do you have ability to take those decisions? And these are real life, large uh, examples, right? Then you have what is at stake. If you are a CEO of a large listed company, there is some small investor who is probably getting only 10,000 rupees per month. He has invested one share in your company. You take wrong decision. That person's net worth would be, uh, would be a challenge or a question mark. So, are you confident or are you super confident that that minority shareholders interest you would be able to cover? If the answer is yes, you should venture into that path. And of course, you have to do more of business and less of CA for this thing. It's a great transition. There are many success stories and a couple of, um, you know, my known persons and mentors have taken that route. Uh, but I believe the first step is you have to assess your own balance sheet, your skill set, whether you are up for CEO or not. Otherwise, you can continue as CA for there's no harm. One more question from them is that you were auditor earlier. So how was your day then? How was your now and from late night to sleepless nights? So what I'm going to talk about is any which is not a yardstick. Uh, I don't think you should get guided by uh, this. But what I have learned over the period, that also I'll talk about. So when... Uh, and as I mentioned, I joined Ferguson and a uh, couple of my great friends who are still in touch with me. Uh, uh, and I used to have a client just opposite Churchill Station. And in those days, I used to, I think, stay in Borivoli or Dhaisa. Uh, I was from Jaipur, so that is where I got the accommodation. So I used to take the first train from there. I used to come to Borivoli because uh, getting a train from Dhaisa was almost impossible. And I believe today also it's impossible. Uh, and I used to take the last train. I still remember there used to be a train of 12.54 in the night. Every day, every day, me and my friend and my great friend, he's a partner in one of the large firms. We used to do that. And I probably did that uh, for 28 days uh, after a month, uh, out of a month, you know, I did that for, so that, that is what, and, uh, and probably, uh, you know, what Vijay Bhai was trying to understand, I gained because of whatever time I invested in those days. Uh, over the period, I realized that work-life balance is important. Uh, uh, of course, uh, personally to you as an individual, you get, you get other responsibilities, you get married, you have other, uh, you know, expectation, you have your in-laws, your parents and everything. But I think the larger thing is, if you continue to slog, you are indirectly passing on the message to the team members that you, expectation from you is that you also please take 12.54 a.m. last local, which is the biggest learning. So when I moved to Polycap, the principle and by and large have been able to follow that is I leave at 5 p.m. Irrespective of what happens. Uh, but the, my team knows that I'm working. Um, uh, by and large, uh, I attend emails uh, within two to three minutes. 
uh, whether it's a 12 in the midnight or five o'clock, because it's a large organization. If you are not giving approval, there's something which has gone wrong. Uh, and if you're not getting approval, then it will have some business implications. Someone will stop. So, but the fact is you should not remain in the office because indirectly you are passing on the message. And at the same time, um, explain to the team that if you are writing an email at five o'clock in the morning, expectation is not that you have to attend at five o'clock. You attend whenever you want to attend. But work-life balance is important. I am not disputing that, but it is your personal choice. If you decide to slog or if you decide to invest more time in your office activities, please don't expect that your team members and colleagues would also do the same thing. Let them have their own independent decision. We are almost half past seven. Uh, any other thing which you want to cover? Otherwise, <laughs> I have pretty much covered what I wanted to cover. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, please, Mirai. I am looking forward to 75th year of BCS under your uh, leadership, Mirai, and I'm sure I'll continue to get opportunity to interact with you and the larger team. <laughs> One thing that though I have fun, and I want to join the stage, but at the end of the stage, you bring much is extraordinary. That's what this lecture has delivered to us. And uh, I will frankly admit that this was uh, I started my journey for the presidency with the first lecture meeting, which is from my field of auditing with Kira Ramesh. And I'm ending my term with the last lecture meeting, which is again from an audit fraternity, though now CFO, and you are addressing that. So it has been a wonderful journey for me too. And uh, the way you have taken us through your journey, I think there would it has been an inspirational talk, which will open the mindset of many youngsters to look at the things in the right perspective, be it as an auditor or be as a CFO. There, is, there are no shortcuts. But if there is a hard way, if you learn and if you put in a full efforts, I think success is always of a person who is putting in the hard It was a very well deserved vote of time. Once again. Thank you, Ganda. I think a wonderful session uh, to get an insight on what's on the auditor side and what's on the CFO side. I think your compatibility with BCS, uh, you know, helped you as well as us today, where you could uh, courageously share uh, all your nuances of movement from auditor to CFO. And I think I should appreciate, and we all should appreciate that with the honesty, clarity, and the content you gave today. I think a lot of youngsters as well as people who want to move from audit fraternity to CFO would have got some insights and would have taken uh, that back along with them. So thank you for that. Thanks for sharing uh, all of this uh, with us. And before I end, I'll just announce the events for the day uh, for BCN. So uh, just for uh, the participants, we have the uh, 11th residential study course on NDS, which is starting on 24th of June at Deltin Daman. Various speakers for two days, uh, two night, three days uh, by the accounting and auditing committee. So please take advantage of that. There is a session on data cloud and network securities, best practices planned on 2nd July by the technology initiative committee. It's a half day workshop. Then 26th ITF international tax conference, uh, which is there from 4th uh, August to 7th of August. Uh, uh, then we have leadership power of attraction, a leadership workshop by human resource committee. Uh, then we have the 74th founding day on 6th of July as every year. Uh, this time we have a speaker, uh, uh, which is N. Chandra Shekharan from Tata. Uh, uh, he's going to be speaking on future trend, risk and opportunities. And then uh, we have a students program, which is Taran on 25th of July. Uh, at KC College. So uh, we would request all the members to take the most benefit of all the programs. 
Uh, with this, I would request all the participants online and offline to give a round of applause to our today's speaker, Vendor. Thank you. Thanks. Half rain. Yeah. <laughs>